And our speaker, uh, second program today, is called From Daguerreotype to Digital Images, How to Preserve, Protect, and Share Your Photographs. And Susan Hill is co-owner of Photo Dark Room, which is an award-winning company that has been offering photo production services to San Diego County clients for more than 35 years. And she's an expert in the field, and we're looking forward to hearing what she has to say today. So let me introduce Susan Hill. Thank you very much. Thank you, and um, thank you, Peggy, as kind of this talk is a compliment to um, the genealogy that, uh, very informative genealogy talk um, earlier today. Um, some of you are here interested in genealogy. Um, some of you want to know about how to preserve your family history, and others would like to know what are we going to do with all these digital images that we have created. So hopefully after today, um, You'll learn a little bit about storage. You'll learn about, um, I'll talk about what archival means and what you can do to keep your family photos alive. And um, understand better how to manage and carry your art for your archives. Um, so although this talk is not about genealogy, sharing your photos really is um, an important way for you to connect your, your family's past. This actually is a project that we did. Um, uh, it combined with an artist um, here in, in the Escondido area. And it's a, as you can see, a photo genealogy tree. I thought it was rather interesting. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times by having something like this or any of your uh, photographic genealogy, you really do help uh, um, uh, to protect your family's legacy. And that legacy is something that you can pass on, um, the stories, the, the depth of family that, that you have, and, and sometimes you didn't know you had, um, can, can carry on. And it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great connection to the future, uh, from the present to the, to the next generation. Um, although most of us have, in fact, moved to uh, taking photos uh, digitally, we, some of us have hundreds and maybe even thousands of photos, slides, transparencies, negatives, and they need to be cared for and organized and presented so that your family can enjoy them in the future. Um, so what do we do? First of all, we've got to gather them up. Some are hidden in attics, some are in basements, if you have them here. Some are in closets, some are in aunt's houses, some are who knows where. So gather them up um, and bring them all together. And then you can, that's the biggest kind of effort to get yourself organized, is getting everything together. Um, where they're stored can be a real potential um, benefit or a time bomb really can have a devastating effect on, on your, your photographs and your materials. So, what should they be stored in? Archival is the key. Archival, archival, archival. That's the operative word. Um, means non-acidic, non-lignin, and has a pH of 7.1 or greater. That's the same materials that a place like the museum right here would be using. Archival boxes, sleeves, um, and for, not just for photographs, for all types of materials that you have. Books, uh, 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 fabrics, uh, so it, it runs the gamut. Um, they, again, they um, will protect not only from, hopefully from pests, but also from light. Light is the number one source of damage for your photographs. Um, just start looking at your, at your photographic albums and old photos and you'll see which ones have been uh, shown, and you'll see the effects of, of the, the light. Um, the negatives should be stored in um, acetate-free plastics, your prints in acid-free envelopes, and all these in boxes. Um, where do you get it? Where can you buy it? There are a number of very good um, sources online. Um, there are uh, print file, archival methods, uh, archival products, your university products, those are just a few. Um, they are all very good sources. Um, you'll be amazed at what's out there. They are not inexpensive, but you cannot replace your old family photographs, period. Um, local options are your better art supply stores. Um, here in the greater San Diego area, Blick um, Art in the San downtown uh, Little Italy area um, has a lot of these products or they can order them for you, okay? And um, a lot of times, 
we'll, we will get very ingenious, or not ingenious, but very enthusiastic and order all these archival supplies only to find out they don't fit um, the medium that we have. A lot of you will have um, negatives from, say, your parents or grandparents' generation. Um, most, many of those negatives were made. They were not, they were, they were self-made. So the photographer made the negative, Whoa. cut the negative, or had a unique camera, cut the negative, and printed them. Nowadays, we buy a roll of film, if we do that, and that's all uh, standard size. So be careful when you're, when you're purchasing some of these items to actually have your materials in front of you and know what you want to store and how you want to store it. But those are really good tips. Um, museum quality storage is best, again, um, acid-free, lignin-free. Not all storage material is acid-free, but they will say it's archival. You need to make sure that you read thoroughly and use a reputable service, uh, or buy from a reputable service. Um, you know, if you skip on this now, it can come back in the future. Um, so, although you can't change the past, um, the longevity of your photos really does depend on how they've been stored. Um, but some of it isn't your fault. Some of it, the longevity of the photos are going, and the images that you have really depend on the 19th and 20th century printing techniques, some of the um, chemicals and the processes that they were used. Um, they didn't know, but they are not uh, lasting. Um, this image right here is not a sepia tone print. Most people will uh, bring or have a print and say, oh, it's a wonderful sepia tone. It's an absolutely lovely print that was mounted on cardboard, and what you see there is the brown tone from the acid from the cardboard. And I would say that without looking at a collection, um, half or three quarters of the quote sepia tone prints or the brown tone prints are actually acid deteriorated prints. So, um, th then the other factor that's, uh, the next factor that affects the longevity is the photographic paper. Um, fiber based paper was used by professional and very high-end photo studios. Um, it is the most stable paper. It's actually a cotton fiber that is uh, washed and beaten and then rolled. Um, so it's not a paper pulp at all. It's a cotton fiber. Um, and your uh, very fine portraits that you will see maybe in um, some museums or maybe you have some in your own um, archives, the really fine ones, those most assuredly are fiber-based, and they have the longest um, life, okay? Um, but a lot of the damage that we see is either one of three things. It's chemical, physical, or environmental. A lot of the chemical, we can't change. It's already happened in the processing. Um, and it's not just old ones. There are chemical problems from the 50s, from the 60s, from the 70s, even as the 80s, and we moved into digital. And we have everyone printing out lots of prints on their home digital printer and printed them on paper that was not stable or were using inks that were not archival and in 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years begin to fade. So um, the chemical is not always all your fault. Not all the damage is the same. The physical is something that you can control, you can stop or can help control. Physical is things like uh, improving the storage, uh, ensuring that pests are not uh, eating away the emulsion of your film or your um, or your paper. Um, some of the prints are albumin prints, which is an egg white, and pests love the egg white, and they will nibble it right off. Um, and then the environmental problems are um, again more insects and mold. Um, and that you can help control. Once you get mold, there are ways to um, help stop the mold process. Um, and uh, we have been successful with um, more film than, than photographic prints. The prints, once the prints become moldy, it's embedded into below the surface and into the chemical, uh, sur the surface and, and into the paper is much more difficult. But there are processes that, that uh, can be employed to help um, uh, reduce the amount or further, uh, stop growing, mold growing for any further. Um, but the most important is light. Um, light damages your photographs. Um, 
and sunlight is the worst. Um, many of you may have photos that are in frames in your home, and when you take them out of the frame, you look, oh my goodness, these were lovely colors at one time. You'll see the perimeter that's been blocked uh, from the sunlight, and it really, um, you'll be able to, to really see the difference and kind of be shocked. These are examples of some of the chemical damage. Um, this one on the far left is an example where it was not washed and fixed properly, so you see a lot of gray in the background particularly. The one on the right is um, poor processing and color shifting. Unfortunately, in the 60s, um, Kodak brought out a new paper called RC paper, and um, uh, professionals as well as amateurs alike um, use the paper as their uh, is their main paper source. It's a wonderful paper. Um, Kodak product is archival, and so the professionals, and that's what you get. Okay, it's it, it's yeah, it's sad. Um, the one on the left here um, is what I consider kind of an, an environmental. Up in the far, if I can use this pointer, forgive me, I've been. Right up here, you may not be able to see it on, on this screen. There's um, actual fingerprint. Um, a good uh, sleuth probably could tell you exactly whose fingerprint that was. <laughs> um, so then, now, we all just touch our, um, any of our materials with the, at the perimeter, so we hold the negatives by the side, um, and not never the face. Um, people will um, want to show prints, and they will deal them out like a deck of cards that is just very um, damaging to the surface of the prints. And it may be the only copy that you have. Yes? I would say, you know, I scan a lot of photos for my clients' books and 9 out of 10 have fingerprints in the corners. Yes. And you see them when you digitize the photo, it's very obvious. Yeah. One of the things, and you bring up a good point, you see them when you digitize the photos, it always amazes me when I'm, I, we've digitized hundreds of thousands of photos. And I'll look at it and it looks fine. It looks good. And then once it's digitized, you just see every flaw. And we've had customers, they don't really say this, but I know they look by the look on their face, they say, what did you do? It's like, well, we scanned it. We've got every bit of information, including every scratch, every emulsion problem, everything that you could ever want. Um, so, so yes, that, that is um, a real good point. This um, second print here, just to give you an idea of, of you know, some, some prints that are really beyond your control, that is considered a proof print. It is not square on the, the proof, the paper, and the image were not squared up, they were not centered. Um, it's probably a contact proof print, uh, if that. And they were quick and easy ways of showing the potential client or the, the person, this is what we have, this is, you know, it's a, it was uh, developed very quickly, um, so for expediency, and so they were not properly washed, they were not properly, properly fixed, and they were printed on what is called single weight paper. So if you go into your archives and you'll see a client maybe one photograph and you think, oh my gosh, this is a beautiful, handsome photograph, it's well printed and it's head down heavy paper, and then you'll find some flimsier ones that have a lot of browning tone to them or kind of fading. Those would be considered, or could very well be considered some proof prints. Um, and again, they were just very hastily printed just to get them out. Okay. Uh, this is an example of a tintype. We had a person bring this in and literally just toss it. These are very rare and uncommon, and the damage, you know, there's silver on the, uh, uh, there's uh, flaking on the, on the surface, and that cannot be brought back. Other photos by a trained photo conservationist can be um, improved, but something like this tintype, it cannot. Um, this is an example of mold here on these prints. And this one, Okay, you cannot see it as well on the, on the slide, but on, it is on, on the, the photograph. Um, those photos are, are, are 25 years old. So that's, a, that's an issue of, of storage. So handling and storage is critical for what we can do today to stop any further um, deterioration in our archives. Okay. These two photos 
were taken in 1992. This is a direct result, and they look this bad in the original. Um, these are a direct result of um, sunlight exposure, um, and also the company that took them. So some of your lesser expensive photo studios, um, big, I call them big box stores, but they're no longer big box stores. Some of the, the big uh, photo studios at your major department stores or uh, the church, uh, you know, organizations would come around to the church and take a whole series of photographs. Um, those were typically printed on very inexpensive paper and very hastily, and so are more, more subject to deterioration and fading than uh, maybe a higher quality studio. So those are some things, again, this one, these exposure to direct sunlight and poor chemical use is something that we can change today. Uh, this is an example of uh, chemistry here. You can see where it's all uh, yellowing at all. Um, this is, should be the closer to the original color. Uh, when you're bringing back the color in a photograph, if you've got one that's terribly damaged like this, the green isn't going to go green because then that yellow is going to go completely yellow. Um, here's an example here, what I talked earlier about, about the emulsion literally being eaten away. And they ate through the paper. There are some pests that love paper. They love, love paper. So getting your, your archives in the proper storage units are, is critical, if nothing else. It will also give you an opportunity to kind of go through and get things organized, you know, and, and, and all. Um, the photo on your, or the image on your left is um, a hand oil photograph. Many of you will see that in your um, archives. That was printed on a fiber-based paper, and it was hand oiled. If properly stored, this is close to 100 years old. It will remain um, in this condition, which is a very good condition for another 100 to 200 years. Proper storage. Okay, it's not going to deteriorate. The oils are high quality oils and it, it was printed on a fiber-based paper. The one on the left is a, considered a crayon portrait. Um, uh, Peggy and I talked about that the other day. Um, crayon portraits are kind of an interesting, you may have some in your, in your archives, um, are an interesting uh, uh, photograph because they actually are photographs. They were printed um, as a special process and it was typically uh, available to the wealthy. And um, it was the one uh, life-size image that, that a person might have had taken of themselves. And um, the photographer would print it on very thin paper, a very light image, and then, or artist, and then the artist would actually draw in um, all the detail. So it looked like it was an actual portrait and not a photograph. But this is considered, a, and the word is crayon, but it could be either uh, with, um, with uh, pencils, some type of pencil. Um, typically though, or pastel. Pastel was another um, option. Um, but you can see here that this one is, has water damage here, a tremendous amount of water damage here. And um, this crayon portrait, again, is not sepia tone. That brown staining is purely the cardboard backing. And this paper is very, very thin, so it had to be put on something. And that is purely the cardboard um, backing and the effects of the acid that's coming through. Kind of shift gears here. 1826 was the first photographic image produced in um, France. Uh, by 1900, about 75 years later, um, the brownie was introduced. The brownie camera here, you can see here, gals out for a Sunday afternoon. And um, Kodak introduced it, and they sold it for $1, and it was um, the first mass-produced uh, uniform camera. Before that, there were other, uh, many other cameras but the, as I mentioned earlier, film, camera sizes, all vary. This was a uniform camera, sold for $1, and it was uh, mass marketed. By 1960, we had 3 billion uh, photographs are taken yearly. That's worldwide, 3 billion. And at that time, 55% of them were babies. Yes. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. No, okay. By 1980, there were 86 billion photos taken yearly. Then. We have the digital revolution. In 2015, one trillion, yes, one trillion photos 
taken annually. Okay? And a lot of them, even the photographer gets into the uh, photograph of today. The digital revolution really has exploded in every capacity. It's, um, in, in good ways and then in, in ways that are really challenging. Um, so the biggest challenge is what do you do with all of these images that you have? How do you store them? Um, some decisions, some questions you ask are personal questions. How many photographs do I need of the dog? How many photographs do I need of the cat? <laughs> truly, truly, truly. Um, when my father passed away at a rather young age, I contacted his mom, my grandmother, and asked for some family photographs. And she gave me eight. And I thought that was a little stingy, but I was lucky to have those. And when I go back, I thought, no, she was brilliant. Birth, or young, three to four year old, seven, eight year old, 10, 12 year old, 17 year old, 21 year old. Those are the benchmarks where you really are noticing the difference. So if you're worried about your archives, how many photos should you keep? It's kind of, you know, it's a good way because some, to, to think about those benchmarks and those in that timeline. Um, sure, it's great to have every birthday party and it's great to have every anniversary and, and all, but how, those are our memories. So when, when we pass on, what memories are we going to pass on? Yes, it's wonderful if we are in the farming industry to show our farm and what our agricultural roots were like or if we were in, in another type of business, but to have the massive, think about what you're giving, what you're giving to your family and then what the other side's giving to your family. So, what do you do with the old photos you have? And with the digital revolution came revolution in digital scanning. Not all scanners are the same, so if you want to do it yourself, I'll give you some tips here. These are the same things that we do, for the most part. Uh, again, not all scanners are the same, so you do get what you pay for. And don't be fooled by a lower price scanner. Um, if you're just scanning something to send to a friend, or you need to make a quick copy and whatnot, that's one application. If you're scanning for archival purposes, that's a different. We scan at 600 dpi um, original size. If it's, if it's a negative or transparency, any type of film, if it's a glass negative, if it's a uh, um, uh, tintype, anything, we size um, 8x10, 600 dpi. Now that creates a huge file, um, and I'll get uh, into that a little bit later. The mode, it's always RGB. There are options for grayscale, black and white, uh, you want RGB, that's a three color channel, R is for red, G is for green, and B is for blue. Um, and the bit depth, um, that is the amount of information that is available on each uh, channel. Um, we scan at 48 bit depth, which means there's 16 bits per channel. So 16 red, 16 green, and 16 blue. That works out to be 218 trillion color options. So you've got all the information. Um, and there are two file formats that you can choose from. Most of us are really familiar with the JPEG format. That's what most of our uh, cameras and our cell phone images, um, that, that's the file extension for it. Um, and I find it a little interesting because it says it's Joint Photographic Experts Group, that's what JPEG stands for, um, and yet that is not the best file to save your images to. The best is tag, or, or excuse me, TIFF. Um, your TIFF files are bigger, they contain um, a tremendous amount of information, and uh, when you actually go to view a JPEG file, the file is compressed. It's smashed down. And so it's flat versus, uh, I say, it's you know, one dimensional versus three dimensional. That's not quite right. But just for, for sake of uh, understanding, the TIFF format is what is called a lossless compression. So when you view it, none of the information is lost. 
it is lossless. A lot of blah in there. Uh, so always TIFF um, to file format. Again, that makes for very, very, very large files. So what do you do to preserve? 321. Peggy mentioned some things um, earlier. Um, three copies, your original, and two backups. Always. Um, stuff happens. It happens and it happens. Um, so this is for digitized images or digital images that you want to save. Three, two, one. Three copies, two locations. Uh, actually, it should be two formats. So you save it three copies on two different formats. One would be a hard drive and maybe CDs. If you have large, uh, a large archive, though, you're going to have a lot of CDs. Um, and today, some computers don't even have CD drives. So extended hard drives and the cloud are um, two options for storage. And then one should be stored off-site. Safe deposit boxes actually are coming back in vogue. They can be big enough to hold your um, hard drive. And they are, uh, safe deposit boxes are in secure, uh, temperate, uh, good humidity, safe locations, um, fire, flood, hurricane, typically are not going, we don't have to worry so much about some of that here, but are not going to um, destroy your original. Um, so, the cloud is an excellent use. Um, however, I do caution you um, not to bash Kodak because they were the greatest in, you know, forever. But Kodak did have a file sharing and saving um, uh, program and uh, they discontinued it. They merged it to somewhere else, to, to another online service, and then it was discontinued and many of the people didn't pay attention and all their photos were washed. So that's something to remember. The cloud is great. I, I uh, think highly of it, but that should not be your um, only or final source. It is permanent until it's not permanent. Hard drives, they can crash. Um, they are movable parts inside. Um, CDs, uh, we use gold CDs. Um, they ha uh, gold CDs have a life expectancy of 100 years. Um, your regular CDs, between 5 and 10 years, if that. If they're subject to heat, um, any type of chemical, uh, too much plastics and all, they can deteriorate even sooner than that. Um, and so, so that's something to, to think about. Um, the next thing is the photographic permanence of digital prints. It's a real challenge today. Um, the word archival is thrown around so loosely um, that it is very, very difficult, even when you're talking to a professional. Um, and most people compare the cost of a digital print from a professional lab and what you can get at box stores and are aghast. Well, you should be, because the box stores run them off and they are not, the permanence is maybe five, maybe seven years. A professional lab, uh, the permanence is anywhere between 75 and 150 years. And, and again, that really depends on the materials that are, that are being used. Um, so, uh, lastly, to um, make sure that if you are using um, cloud storage, that you have proper password understanding among family and friends that you want to share. And um, some technological changes will make some files unreadable. In other words, as I said, um, some computers don't even have CD drives anymore. So how are you going to view the CD? And what is going to be coming next? Remember these? <laughs> Our beta? <laughs> I hear a couple of laughs, you know, where VHS or beta. Um, where do we go from there? So you need to upgrade every 10 years your storage. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Um, uh, when you're in this type of business, you, we, we try to stay on top of it. Um, but we really don't know where it's going to go. Blu-ray uh, Blu was supposed to be the up and coming and that kind of died off. So we, we do pay attention um, uh, for our, uh, when we do do scanning the large archive, we present it on, on an extended hard drive. We also use the cloud for our business and then we also have a server. Um, 
I think that's going a little far for, for some people, but like a historical site or a museum here, um, our server is a four bay server. It's a mirror and then a spiral. So mirrors, yeah. so the original, and then there's a duplicate copy, and then there are two more and they spiral and they take a little bit from each one. And so you know that if you lose the first two, and you're not going to lose everything. E everything ever, unless it was just away and then I might not be here either. So, <laughs> anyhow, um, so you know, storage. What is permanent? Um, it's evolving, and and I wish I had better answer than that. Um, the hard drives are great. Um, they're one and two terabyte now, and, and even even bigger. Um, uh, I think if we all reflect, we get what we pay for. Go with brand name companies, um, and you'll be a lot more uh, satisfied. Um, so this brings me to a little bit of kind of what uh, some questions I might be fielding, so I'll field them before we get to it. Um, if you do have photographs, as I showed earlier, that need restoration, what do you, what do you look for? Um, first of all, it, uh, a photo restoration should have a, a portfolio, um, either in person or online. Sometimes it's not as easy to change their portfolio online, so it may be a little stale. But interview them. Um, look at their work. Is it all the same type of work? Is it colorizing? Um, the the uh, common activity a number of years ago would be have a, take a, a photograph of a small child, and then the, the, the flower the child was holding would be pink, and the rest would be black and white. Well, that's a real easy, once you learn it, that's an easy skill. Look at, at, at a portfolio. Does all the work look the same? Or is it a whole variety of different um, uh, challenges? And there are many challenges out there. Um, um, ask questions. Ask lots of questions. No one should be embarrassed um, to answer. Uh, uh, do they outsource? Uh, India is, is out, a lot of things are outsourced to India. You don't want to send your uh, work to a lab or a um, studio that does send it away. Um, we do receive quite a few um, orders um, from persons all over the country. Um, it's kind of, we live in a big city so we can drive and so we don't think we need to send things anywhere. But if you're in, in Louisiana or parts of Wisconsin or parts of Idaho, there are the resources and they do in fact have to send things or they will bring, you know, families coming so they will bring materials. Does the studio send out the originals? Do they work on the original print? I'm not a photo conservationist. I'm not going to say I'm a photo conservationist. Those are highly trained persons. The cost to uh, conserve an original photograph is very expensive and uh, many and years of education. Um, so if anyone says that they work on the original, I would run, not walk, um, or you know what you're going to be paying. Um, the digital rescan, the digital restoration, improves the copy, is, is a copy print. The original is not touched, that's for your archives and for you to take care of and, and do as you, um, to store properly. This is a, just one example of a print that was um, faded beyond, uh, almost beyond recognition, and then bringing it back to life. You can bring a lot of things back to life, but if, if your originals are stored properly, and if they're well, well printed initially and stored properly in the proper conditions, there's no need for this. There should be no need for this. Um, so, uh, in closing, we're all seated at the banquet of life, and sharing our family photographs and and our family history is a, a rich and engaging and uh, very nice uh, um, uh, legacy to pass on to the rest of your family. So I'm welcome to take any questions. I thank you for, for listening. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I find with the digital age, I have so many pictures that are still on the computer. Yes. And in the camera. Or yes. Or in my phone. Or yes. I've had them. Yes. Uh, I mean, is there any good programs for organizing all that on, on your computer? Uh, 
There are. There are a number of programs, and I actually, I think I skipped part about talking about the cloud, so I should say something about that. Um, the cloud, there are several very good um, uh, online sources. Google Photo, iCloud, Dropbox, uh, OneDrive. Those are all very good uh, photo sharing and photo storage sites. When you, when you look online, um, they all have different uh, features and benefits. See which one works best for you. Some are more costly. Um, some have greater file sharing opportunities. Some even have editing software that you can, easy editing that you can you, use. Um, some of them, though, compress the files. So if you're doing this for an archival purpose and you put it up in one of the, the uh, use one of the, the sources, um, many of them, one of them I know for certain will compress it. So when you bring it back down, it's, you didn't get what you paid for. So if you have scanned it, 600 DPI, TIFF image, you know, biggest byte file that you can, and you send it off and it, it will come back nice little postcard size. And that's not what you want if you want to restore it later on. Okay. So, and as far as, as, as cataloging, a lot of that is very personal. There are there are um, uh, several services, along with um, the storage the device, the storage companies that will allow for organization. But part of it is you have to kind of get that organization in your mind. Do you want to organize by person, by location, by date? Chronologically is really the most, the easiest and the most intuitive. Um, all of your digital files, whether or not they're on a phone, camera, scanner, they have a tremendous amount of information. Uh, and I didn't really talk too much about that because you need to use a file editing software in order to um, access that information. But one of the things that you'll be able to see just on your computer is the date it was created, and the file size, and the image size. So you can rename it if you're, if you're so inclined, but you'll see the date and the file size. I find personally to organize it by date. And you know, July 4th, oh, that's right, the parade. This is what went on the July 4th, birthdays, it, and Thanksgiving, and the first of the year. And so it's very, it's a lot easier to, to, uh, uh, to stay organized that way. And some of it is you have to edit. Um, we, the digital age is so easy to capture so much, but how many, I mean, that's why I just gave that little anecdotal story. How many do we really want? And they're, when I'm taking the photographs, they're my memories. They're not my children's memories. They're my memories of my children. They remember things, yes, but maybe a little differently. <laughs> Okay, maybe a little, maybe, maybe it wasn't all that much fun. Okay, and that camping trip, it's like, psh, let's get rid of those. So, um, I mean, I hope I've answered, you know, your question, but a lot of, you bring up a good point though. You need to get those photos off your phone. You need to get them off your, off your um, cameras. I can't tell you how many times uh, people will say, oh, I, I know I had it on my camera. Well, the card can go back. They can go back, and they don't give you any notice. They don't start blinking a little bit, or they don't start only accepting a couple of images. They just don't work. So if you do take a lot of photographs, uh, one suggestion that I do have um, to help uh, eliminate or avoid that problem is um, put the date that you purchased that card on, on the front of the card. And after it gets old, a couple years old, three, four years old, get a new one. If you took that many photographs with, with film, you'd be, you'd be editing a lot more. You know, you'd be editing yourself in the photographic <coughs> process. So they're re relatively inexpensive and just write a little date on it. That's what we do at our, we look at it and say, oh, this is getting old. And we just use it for tests or use it for, you know, for non-important uh, use. Yes? Um, how about BMP format you know, or PNGs in addition to TIFF and JPEG? Um, I think that's overkill. I have a lot of old, old digital, digital photos that were done in the Microsoft on BMP because they used to be the standard. Correct. And it was a lot more higher, higher fidelity than JPEG, especially when you didn't have the ability to control the degree of, of uh, 
of compression of a JPEG. Correct. Uh, some of the modern scanning software will allow you to choose from a very little compression to almost no compression, still within the JPEG format. Correct. Um, should I change my BMPs to to JPEG or TIFF? No. Not to JPEG. How about uh, PNG? Um, pretty much the same. Um, I, we don't work that much anymore with PNG at all. Um, now it's uh, the DNG, which is the di digital negative. Um, that is going to be evolving to be the standard, um, and we're watching that very closely. Um, the major uh, manufacturers, camera manufacturers, are, are, are migrating to the DNG, um, so that's going to be the file format that you, you'll be seeing. Um, but uh, I would keep it with either TIFF or WAIT and see what type of uh, migration you can do to the DNG. How do you feel about thumb drives as a storage mechanism? They're getting very large thumb drives now for very little money. Oh yeah, they're yeah. awesome. They're awesome for quickies. Like this presentation, they're awesome for quickies. For storage, for permanent storage, no, no. We actually use um, SanDisk, a storage vault, and it is not a thumb drive, and it is not a hard drive, uh, but they're small. They're eight gigs, which isn't much. I mean, not compared to what? SD card you're talking about. No, it's called a memory vault. It's about yay big, oh, okay. okay? And um, it's not well supported, but I really like it to give to our, for a short-term storage, not a archival 100 years storage, but a shorter-term storage to give to, to, to clients in transferring, because first of all, these thumb drives, most of us probably have five or six laying around. And so now we don't even know which one is which and, and all. Hard drives, um, if you don't have a large enough capacity um, or, or pay attention, they will crash. It's not a matter of when, it's a matter of, you know, it's not a matter of if, it's, it's a matter of when. Um, your computer, your whole computer can die, all right? So I like these little memory vaults. They have an 8, 16, and 32 gig, which is not very big, but for 200 photographs, they're great. But okay, what's the interface? Pardon me? What's the interface? What, electrically, how do they Oh, it's just a USB. 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 Yeah, it's USB. How, how long will USB be around? And, you know, and see, that, those are good questions. You know, those are, those are good questions. Um, and that's why, you know, I said, some computers don't have CDs anymore. CDs don't even last. Right. Many of you may not even realize that they don't last. I mean, people are worried about using ink pens and, and, and whatnot. I'm thinking, yeah, you should worry about that. But, I mean, we have customers bring back work or, or bring back, uh, uh, bring photographs that they had at their wedding that someone put on a, on a, on a, on a CD, and the wedding isn't 10 years old. Like, do you, did you back this up anywhere? Yes. Can you comment on HDR enhancements? Yeah. Yeah? No, like <laughs> you don't like them? No, oh. I mean, no, they're great, they're great. But I mean, I, you look at, I mean, what I, so photographically, and I scenic a little bit, that's okay. But when you see, if you go online and you're looking at, at some of these homes that are for sale, and they're all HD, it, they look absurd. It, 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 it makes um, the face too contrasty. The colors are just so blown out. Um, so they can make some lovely scenic photos. But as far as is, is, is HDR, it, I'm not a big fan of it at all. It's more an artistic It's medium. more, yes, it's more yeah. creative. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I have a Super 8 film reel, which is about <laughs> a thousand feet. And I went to Costco because I went to have a transfer to a CD and I would have to pay almost a thousand dollars to oh. have it done. Is there any place else? Where okay, so we were talking about genealogy today and, and, and photos. But you're bringing up a really good point. Uh, 8 millimeter, 16 millimeter film, if you have it, you have to get it transferred. It will develop what is called vinegar syndrome, and that is not a joke. When, um, and if it's acetate, um, it will develop dirty sock syndrome, and that is not a joke. It is deteriorating, and there is nothing you can do. So it needs to be transferred. Your VHS. Since 1970. Yeah. You're, that's, an, that's new. Usually it's from the 50s. And so they are really, really, the 40s, the 50s, maybe even the 30s, they're really old. 
um, and we get them in all the time. We'll open the can up very gingerly, and, and or not even, you can even smell if it's not been stored properly. Heat, temperature, if it hasn't been closed real well, uh, more oxygen has gotten in there, and it's just an oxidation problem. So it is expensive. Um, I will say um, big box stores, um, send it away. Um, you need to be careful um, with photo restorationists or having any of your material duplicated, you do need to be careful as to where it goes and what happens to it. Um, uh, Costco does a great job on a lot of things and, uh, you know, all thumbs up for them. I would knock any company for what they do well. I just would ask a lot of questions first. Yeah. Uh, I do know with them that uh, when you have your material transferred, they retain, the company that they use retains the copyright. Mm. You say, what? Wait a minute. That's not mine? Mm. You say, nope, it's not yours. It's not yours. Mm. Um, and it is expensive, but if you don't get it transferred, you, um, time is of the essence. And, and more for the film than for anything else. But why is it so expensive? I mean, they put it on once and then... It's know, time. Pardon? It's all time. So if it's a thousand, yeah, yeah it's all time. It's that's it's it's all time. I don't know if it would be. It, it's a thousand feet. I know it's. it's um, but I mean, it's been very well kept. That's Close superb. The cool uh, area, and you know. But our business does do those transfers all types of films um, that are that are available. We yeah. even print from film. We will even print from movie film. We had a customer come in and who was in the movie theater in Los Angeles in the, um, in the 40s and saw his father in the newsreel on D-Day. Oh. And went and, now uh, granted it's not an original new, the original film footage that the, okay, that the news cameraman took. But he went up and he got that film and we were able to print it. We can print microfiche, x-ray, um, lantern slides, uh, tin types, uh, glass negatives, glass plates, um, yeah. the, all the media that has been, pretty much all the media that has been developed in the last 150 years were able to, um, to print. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the, the, the film is important, getting your VHS tapes, that's all tape, that's going to die soon. Mm -hmm. Yes? If you have old negatives and you don't have the picture of the negatives, oh. do your company does that, do other places do negatives, make prints from negatives? Um, or is that kind of old school? It is very old school, that's, that, we're really a, a, a niche okay. uh, business. It's very old school. Um, now everything really is digital, so those negatives would be digitized. They would not be printed. Uh, years ago, we printed from negatives. We, printed black, we had a black and white lab and a color lab, a big lab, and, and so we would use the original materials. Okay. When you're when you are digitizing, you do want to try to use um, as close to the original material as possible. So if you have negatives and a print, you want to use the negatives. If you're going to pay for the scanning, you want to use the negatives. Um, the reason being is when you're printing, um, only about 25% of the image that you see is actually on the print. So there's more information on that negative, and that can be, particularly if, if maybe the negative, or and the print maybe is destroyed, the negative will have a lot more information, or if they're both equally deteriorated, the, the negative still, or transparency, but the negative still will have a lot more information on it. So you want to do that. And getting those printed is more and more difficult today than ever before. Um, it's not machined. It's not, you know, right. so. No, not at all. Can yes. you still rent Super 8 projectors? <laughs> Pardon me? Can you still rent Super 8 projectors? Uh, I'll have to look it up on Google, I guess. Yes. Um, I know that um, from time to time we have uh, our business, ha we have super eight projectors and we loan out um, so people can view. But we caution and don't like to loan them because a lot of people don't know how to use the projector and then 
ruin their film, and you're either going to have it transferred or not. <laughs> no, and, and, and that, that's, that's kind of the short answer. It, it's not a very diplomatic one, but you're either going to have it transferred or not. And, and so did you, it's like, yes, okay, great. We got it. And now we know it's safe. Until the next wave of technology. So, you got a question here? What is the purpose of a digital scanner? What are you? Uh, digital scanners can run anywhere from uh, two, three hundred dollars to uh, four and five thousand um, dollars. And then drum scanners um, start at about uh, twelve and go up to twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars. What is the saving the average homeowner that wants to scan? The average homeowner, um, I would say, uh, uh, go with an Epson product. Um, they're uh, a great company. Um, uh, it, they're a great company in terms of um, the product we put out. Um, their service and support is, um, but um, they've been around and they are they are in that business. Where Canon is in the printing business, they're in the uh, camera business, they're in the imaging business, they're in the medical business, Epson is more, I mean, it's, it's growing, but this is their main, their main pocket. Was, um, so is that a good thing to do, the claw and boxes of pictures? Mm -hmm. um, I, we always recommend, when, when people come into our, our business and they'll say, I have a thousand slides, um, we will say, I know you do, but you don't. You don't want all the sunsets. No. Right. You don't need 18 pictures of. So just kind of things. You right. Can. But so first of all, edit and 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 don't be afraid to edit. Edit, 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 and then look at what you really have in terms of um, of prints that you want to have scanned or that you want to scan. Okay. So a scanner, uh, an Epson 500 is a is a medium priced. I think they run about. $350, I could be off on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good, it's a good product. Um, um, but it's time. Scan, when it scans that, where does it, does it go on a CD? Is that it goes. It go, okay. So, see, so you have a learning curve when you're yeah. when you're doing this. You have you have a learning curve. So, uh, so there there is a variety of software. You indicate to the scanner where you want your files to go. So if you want it to go onto your hard drive, to an extended hard drive, to your desktop, uh, that's those are things that you do. You 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 designate the, the location. Okay. Um, so there are a number of different uh, scanner settings. You can put it on automatic and let it go, um, and that's one way of, of doing it. That's not what we would do um, in our business because um, we have, we are bound by what we do to give you the highest quality, the best quality scan. So we will, we will preview it, and then we will go in before the scans have been made and make um, edit adjustments. <coughs> then, uh, in another software program, adjust even further if if we feel so that's right. So when you edit the photo, is that done on the scanner machine? Or? You you can, there uh, there is editing software that you can do on the scanner. There's um, uh, it depends on the scanner company. Okay, but I mean, we have. One scanner for film. We have a scanner for prints. We have a scanner for you know for different applications that we find uh, best fits um, uh, the requirements. But yes, so if you can go in, you can determine the file size, the file type, um, the bit depth, the color depth, and you can name the file and you can indicate where it goes. Any other questions? Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.